Hello and welcome to Bastion and Broadcasting, where everything's running smoothly and there's no problems to see here. Um, so, welcome to tonight's broadcast. Um, tonight, I am doing a combination of two things that have been a lot of fun recently. Um, first of all, if you've been following the, the last few weeks, I have been doing sort of read-throughs of, of other RPGs. Um, that I think have something interesting to look at. Um, they are definitely not reviews, but they are sort of exploring the games to sort of see what what they do interesting, what they do that is interesting, and um, it might help you decide whether or not it's a game that you want to check out, but also um, I'm really more interested in seeing like the bits and pieces of the game and whether there's things that are particularly worth exploring. Um, as well as that, um, around this time last year, actually, um, I sort of became very, uh, like so many of us last year, I became really interested in the idea of solo RPGs. Um, and I liked the idea, but I, I, the implementation was always kind of terrifying to me. And over the last year, I kind of dipped into it a couple of times, and I did do a stream where I ran a kind of solo game myself. Um, and I, you know, I, I made the game Space and Solitude, which is kind of explicitly a single player kind of journaling game RPG. But the game I'm looking at tonight has sort of some elements of a solo game. You, you can play it solo or with a group and it does it in a way that I'm really interested to try out. So we are hopefully gonna be doing a little read through and then um, doing a little bit of actual gameplay of this game. So. You know, I've beaten around the bush enough. Obviously, the game we're looking at is a game called Wonder Home by um, by J Dragon, and this was this was kickstarted, I believe, last year. It, it may have been it may have been slightly longer than, that, than the Kickstarter was released, but it's um, it sort of started to really pick up steam last year, and it is a game that does some really interesting things and some things that specifically really appeal to me. Um, a, lot, a lot of things that I, I've always thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if a game did this? And then, you know, Jay has actually gone and done it. So, <laughs> so fair play. Um, so it's, it's, it's been really interesting. And when I say interesting, I think it's easy to read that as me saying I don't like it. But the truth is I really like it on paper. Um, I'm intrigued to try it out because it's so different to the kind of game that I normally like to play and the kind of games that I make in in some ways. But also it's got a lot in common with what I like in games. So it's in this really interesting middle ground. I'm really interested to try it out. So I'm hoping we can maybe do like first 30 minutes of the stream. We're going to have a look through the game and see why it's kind of interesting to me. And then for the second half, we're going to make character and see if we can do a really quick sort of solo. It won't be a full session. You know, I'm thinking maybe half an hour and just see if we can at least get a little sense of the feel of the flow of the play. And then if we like the way it's gone, maybe we'll pick it up with a sort of part two um, in the future. So, Wonder Home. First of all, the usual caveat. I've already said that this isn't a review, but if you like the look of this game, when once I start describing it, if you like the look of it, um, I think for what it sets out to do, my instinct is that it is doing it very, very well. And what it sets out to do is something really quite specific. And I've said before that I like these games that do something that, that I like these games that know what they are. Like it's not this kind of weird mess of ideas. It's actually really kind of focused and it, it eliminates a lot of things that you might expect to get in an RPG that, that you don't need for this kind of game. And it brings in some really interesting things to make that kind of game work. So let's actually get to it. So Wonder Home. I'm not going to read through uh, every single page, um, but it is a game about journeys. And it is a game, you know, the, the game will explain itself here. Um, it is a game about journeys where you are, again, it, it can be played solo or with a group and with or without a GM, um, which is called like a guide in this system. Um, but the characters that you take on will be um, sort of 
um, animal characters, essentially. Um, and it's a world of animal characters going on journeys. And that is kind of the, the pitch. And the the kind of... I hesitate I hesitate to say twist because it sounds like it's a gimmick or something. But the the thing that is worth knowing about is that it's kind of explicitly a... Again, I'm going to say low conflict. And I don't mean that in a bad way. But it is a low conflict setting. Um, you know, the, it lays out some of the elements of the world really clearly. It says that we'll be meeting people who are fundamentally good. And the world was recently caught in a war, but it is no longer. And there is a widespread culture of hospitality. And you note that the land is beautiful, boundless land, full of life and soul. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with Heath for the pronunciation. I hadn't thought of this until now, but it's got like this, uh, what is it called? An ash a symbol or something, this ligature there. Um, so I'm going to go with Heath. So the land of Heath is kind of animals living largely in... Um, Tranquility might be too far, but certainly it, it is a it is a time when there's no violence. Everybody is kind of peaceful with each other, and people are fundamentally good. Now, of course, there can still be conflict, but we are talking low conflict when you are comparing this to other RPGs, where even even games that are kind of like not explicitly about violence. Um, so again, a really really obvious one would be something like um, lots of the kind of apocalypse world style games they kind of they do have combat in them but they are more about the characters and more about other elements of conflict other other types of conflict maybe um even games like that they have a lot of conflict even if they don't have tons and tons of violent conflict this game is much more about the journey and it is about what happens to your characters on that journey and it took me a good a good while of reading through this to really understand because my first instinct was thinking oh so it's a, a resource management game surely if you're doing a journey and it you know you're managing your rations and your it's like a survival game but it's not that either it really is just a game about going on a journey and we'll see how it works out in play but i'm i'm really interested to try it out so again i'm not going to read through everything here but the journey is the focus of the game you have some journeying tools, which are kind of like safety tools, and then you have a guide for getting set up. I'm going to skip through some of this because I want to get to the bits that really interest me. So, this is the first bit of the game that really got me sort of super excited. And page 18 here and page 19, that's basically all of the rules of the game. Now, that's not entirely fair because a lot of the game is about kind of following certain procedures um it's quite loose in that sense it is kind of like pick and choose what what you want to use at any given moment but in terms of like the closest thing to like a core mechanic you have this system of tokens where you gain a token when you do certain things so if you inconvenience yourself to help someone else or you give away something you hold dear then you get to take a token which can be whatever you're using as tokens in that game then later in the game you can spend a token to do one of these things so ease somebody's pain only for a moment or keep someone safe from the difficulties of the world you do one of them you spend the token and that's the entire sort of mechanical rules of the game i guess and i've said that the game is the pdf i have is 272 pages so i've spoken a lot about enjoying these games that are kind of a simple core that gets put to work and this game is a huge example of that. The core of the game is like super simple. I've, I've, I've basically told you everything there. Um, and this this system is from, um, I believe Avery Alder uh, designed the game called, I'm going to, Dream Askew. And it's the No Dice, No Masters system. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a tried and tested system, but the games that used it before were kind of, in that kind of apocalypse world playbook style of game where you had kind of booklets that you sort of print out and hand out to the players and have out on the table whereas this is like a huge book that's kind of really diving into how to actually run this world so that's the base that is the entire system you're spending a token to do some things and you're getting a token when you do certain other things so there is no 
random dice element of it. There's no, there's a note here about failure in that there is no, you're not going to fail unless you choose to fail. And again, that is something that I'm very interested to try because I have, I have tried solo games now a few times and, but I, I don't think I've ever actually tried a game that is completely diceless. And I think combining the two things, so you've got solo games, which when I've played them, have really relied on like a random element to introduce elements of the unknown. Combining that, removing the dice from that leaves me kind of terrified with what's left because it's it's kind of all on all on you then. But if that was all we, if this page was all we had for guidance, I would think this is not going to work for me. But as you'll see, this book is just filled with things to allow the game to happen, even without the dice. So, I'm going to jump ahead slightly. And I'm going to jump to the playbooks, which are our characters. Now, like I said, our characters are going to be some kind of um, anthropomorphized animal. Um, in this world, all animals kind of live alongside each other. Um, and insects and bugs are kind of like the equivalent of the domestic animals. So here we go. So there are like giant bugs where we might have birds or livestock. So we can be any kind of mammal or bird. And I think fish are like demons or something like like we're not we're not going to be a fish we're going to be some kind of land or air-based animal and i'm looking to the chat i am open to any kind of animal um but i will say i've had a little look through these playbooks ahead of time and there's some interesting stuff in here but the one that i think is going to make our life interesting to be a kind of solo traveler is the pilgrim now we can be an ibis a bison a ferret a newt a devoted animal or a ceaseless animal. But we are going to be the pilgrim. And a huge chunk of this um, game, a huge chunk of this book rather, is dedicated to these, I've heard them called pick lists, which is new terminology for me, but it's kind of like, I guess, a random table without the random element. Um, it's just a list of things to pick. So it's like, again, I'm using Apocalypse World because that's kind of a a common reference point but when you have those lists where it's like choose one of these for your character's look and there's like a list of six things and you pick one and it sounds dead simple but like these are so useful to have and they're so good for like putting prompts in the game they kind of they kind of do the same thing as random tables in your kind of more traditional rpg i guess but the good thing about them is even if you're only choosing one thing from the list you're kind of skimming through the whole list. So it means you're you're picking up the setting in the same way as a random table, but it's kind of even better at that because you're you're kind of forced to look through and absorb all these different elements. So I do have my pilgrim character here ready to go. Ferret or raccoon, I'm seeing in the chat. Giraffe. See, that, another thing that I actually like in this book, which is kind of similar to, you know, I, I've spoken about this before with the mockeries in Electric Bastion Land, which are kind of like animal muppets. How animals are so powerful to use for characters because they just carry so much weight already. So if I, you know, if I tell you that the character is a raccoon, you already kind of are making... It's, it's kind of like stereotypes, really, but like because it's an animal, it's kind of harmless. Um, you're kind of like, you're applying character to these animals because we, we think of something when we think of a, a snake and its personality or, you know, a lizard and what their personality might be like. So I think we're going to go with, I mean, I, I know that I asked the chat and raccoon will be good, but I, I do like this newt. In the artwork, I think that's a little bit. I, I like the cut. You know, I've got nothing against the kind of cutesy aesthetic, but I do like that this newt looks kind of weird. So we're going to go with newt to the pilgrim. Oh, and 
the, the decision that I've made um, is that because I am newt, I'm going to be the only newt. And if we meet a um, if we meet a kestrel, they will be called kestrel, and they will be the only kestrel. So we're going for like a kind of slightly like I guess it makes it feel a little bit more like fairy tale element. And the real benefit is is that I don't have to think of names for all these characters. So his name's going to be Newt, and he is a Newt. So we're going to we've chosen our animal. Now we get to choose two things that we try to be and two things that you've given up on. And you've got a list of kind of qualities here. Now these don't relate to any rules. It's all very kind of qualitative rather than quantitative. So if we say we are healthy, that doesn't mean we're getting like more HP or like a special ability to resist damage. It just It's just there as kind of a prompt and a guideline. So let's say that we are... We try to be, so let's say we try to be, and this this is again, this is where the dice, I would normally lean on the dice because even now I'm thinking like, randomize it and give yourself like a random prompt. But I'm just going to try and like trust in my kind of subconscious and, <laughs> and let that kind of be my random element where I'm not going to overthink it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to try and let my eye be drawn to the one that um, that makes sense. Um, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna go with the first one on the list. So try to be patient and proper. And then we've given up. We've given up on two other qualities. So remain says try to be wise, but I think we're gonna say we're given up on being wise. And. What else we're we giving up on being unobtrusive? So I, I kind of went to that without really knowing what that would mean, because what would it mean that you've given up on being unobtrusive? So I guess maybe in our past, we have tried to be wise and we've tried to be unobtrusive, but we've realized that that's not the way. So I should actually read the, the little bit of flavor text for our pilgrim. The gods have given you a path forward a place you hope can finally give you what you seek. Some days you worry you'll never make it there at all. So that's the first, each each kind of, um, each of these playbooks is four pages. So what's next? Um, three to four words to describe your look. I like the idea of us having a weather-beaten hood. Um, bare minimum needed to get by is interesting. Sturdy walking stick. And we'll stick with those three. If, if it's there's a few times where it says like pick two or three or pick three or four and I'm not going to like agonize over picking <laughs> over filling up my character because I, I do want to keep it simple because like I said this game is ultra simple but there is a lot in this book there is a lot in there and you can kind of like you can almost I, I imagine get overwhelmed with some of the details so we are going to try and keep things simple so a god or omen instructed you to pack your bags and travel somewhere very far away from the land you call home. Choose two rumours or stories that you've heard about this place, and one that is actually true. Okay, so we're picking two that are rumours or stories, and then we've got the actual truth as its own thing. So the rumours about our destination... Are that it is a um, that it's a, a place that scrapes up against the very sky itself, so it's a mountain or a tower. So the rumors are that it's like the Great Tower, let's say. And another rumor that we've heard. Is it's the home home of the one teacher who knows the secret to pure serenity, 
which would mean it's a lagoon or a monastery. So let's go with monastery. So let's say we've heard one story that we're, what we're, the place that we're looking for is the Great Sky Tower. And the other story that we've heard is that it's the monastery of the Great Teacher. However, the truth which I don't know whether we know that this is the truth. I'm guessing we do. So the truth that it's a place that doesn't exist is almost like too obvious. So I'm not going to go with that one. I do like the idea of it being an island. So the truth is that it's a place older than anywhere else in the world. And it's an island or a ruin. So I guess maybe these rumours are things that we have investigated previously. Like we thought that we were looking for a tower. And then we discovered that wasn't true. And we thought we were looking for a monastery with a great teacher and it turned out that wasn't true either. So now we know the real truth is that we're going towards an island or a ruin. Okay. And then our penultimate page choose the sign of your faith and tell the rest of the table why you believe it will never lead you astray so what's the sign of our faith I should say I've been doing these streams for just over a year now it was the end of April that I did the first one last year and with every single stream I've either had a coffee or a ginger beer but tonight I'm breaking tradition and I'm having a tea because this feels like a very tea game. So out of these, I do like the brass compass. Because I'm thinking, well, we'll get to why in a minute. But one of the things that I like about this game is it feels like the kind of attitude that you go into it with will affect the game a lot. And it will affect like the type of game that it is. Like I think some people might treat this very much as a game about identity or about trauma and about recovery and there's there's stuff in this game that backs that up and you know there, there's some things that relate to this theme of the war that happened before there's some things that are to do with like the passage of time and there's some things that are to do with like exploration and sort of going out into the wilderness and all these things are in the book and it's interesting that I think different people would latch on to different bits of it, but I'm feeling like a more kind of exploring the world side of things. So I'm thinking the brass compass, um, which was gifted by a mysterious stranger with a white eye. And then we have some questions that we ask to the left and one to the right. So we're not gonna do those because we're on our own. And then finally, we have some things that you can always do. So, you know, I was saying about how we have these moves. I don't, I don't think they're actually called moves in this game, but they, they are called moves in, in different types of game that, that follow this same system. So let me, uh, let me make a bit of space here. So our moves that we can do to gain a token are all listed here. And our moves that we can do to spend a token are all listed here. However, we also have things that we can always do that are listed based on our um, background here. So these are things that we can always do. Now there was a point in time where I used to look at lists like this, and in certain games I still feel this way, but I used to look at these lists and sometimes it would put me off because I would see something like this where it says it, this list it's given me permission that I can, at any time, I can recite a small prayer. And it used to be that I would think, well, why are you telling me that? Because it feels like by telling me that, that you're telling me that other players can't do that because I've got permission to do it in this list. And I think that's a hurdle that it took me a little while to get over because if you look at these things like as kind of traditional ability in like a traditional D&D, &D, then you want your ability to be unique. You want it to be something that you can do 
but and other players can't do. Something kind of special for your character. And it's not really... My, my understanding is that in this kind of list, it's not really intended to be like that. This isn't saying that no other character can recite a small prayer, but they're almost that little prompt for your character so that if you are in doubt, you can look at this and you can choose something to do. And, you know, some of them are kind of like, almost like a power. Like this, place your fate in improbable coincidence and have it work out. So, you know, take a leap of faith, basically. And... Um, but then some of them are just little prompts. So it's it's a little bit of a paradigm shift, I guess. But I, I've come around to this idea. And I, I do like it now. And that, that's, that's everything for our character. So Newt the Pilgrim. That's it. That, that's it. There's no... You, and one of the things you'll notice is there's not a single number on this character sheet. Which is kind of exciting for me. Um... So there we go. That's our character. Now, what do we actually do? <laughs> That's the question, isn't it? So, what we're going to be doing first of all is we're going to decide. We're going to pick a place where we we're kind of starting our journey. So we already know what our kind of journey is. Our journey is, um, you know, we're looking for this this place older than anywhere else in the world, which we believe is either an island or a ruin. But that's not where we start. We're going to be starting in our first place. So we'll always begin our journey by arriving in a new place. In order to create such a place, pick out, pick out three of the following natures or choose randomly. So we, we, do, we do have the option. And to be fair, actually, I should clarify in the book, the advice for playing solo does say that it is useful to have a kind of randomizer element in there. So I'm kind of going slightly against the grain by by not doing that. But that's kind of a bit of an experiment. I think you could you would have a great time doing this with, with a random element as well. So natures are at, at first glance they look kind of like places. So some of the natures are things like farm, garden, field, and island, which is one of the places that we're looking for. However, they're not, they don't necessarily have to be taken literally, and every place will have two or three of these natures. So, yeah, like it says here, they determine the look and feel of the place, and they can be literal or they can be kind of more abstract. So, a garden could literally be a garden, but it could just as easily be, let, let me get to the garden section it could be a, an actual garden but really it can be any place where everybody has plenty and the world is overthrowing overflowing with gifts and a market could be an actual market with stalls and people selling things but you know it could be any place where people gather with supplies to exchange and you know they get Things like tower, they get really abstract. So it's a place that reaches so high up to the sky that it feels like it scrapes against the clouds. So it could be a tower, but obviously you could have something like a mountain or, you know, you can go really crazy with it and have things like, I don't know, like a hot air balloon. It could be a tower. And these give you little prompts to kind of help you describe that place and to kind of give it a bit of identity. So for our first place, we needed to choose three. So let's make a new note. In fact, let's um, let's get everything lined up. Let's get settled in now. There we go. So this is our first place where we're starting our journey. I'm not going to agonize over getting these just right, but you can you can see the instinct is there. So we wanted to pick, we were picking from comfortable natures, verdant natures, liminal natures. I think we should pick one from each. So, you know, let's let's go with a gut. No, you know what? I'm thinking monastery, actually, because it kind of fits our, kind of fits our pilgrim, na uh, not nature, our pilgrim background. Um, and then let's go with, I quite like 
a a field is speaking to me somehow. And road seems like a good starting point. So we're starting our journey in a place that is has elements of being a monastery, a field, and a road. So let's look at our moves again. We don't have any tokens to spend. We could do some of these things to gain a token. But I think to start with, we do want to kind of just lay out some of the groundwork of this place. And that's the thing. It, it, it explains as well that sometimes you will just do a thing that might actually technically have been a move that involves doing a token. But if you're just doing it naturally, you don't need to worry about this. I get the feeling that if you've played this game for a long time, you might not really use the tokens all that much. Which is strange considering it's kind of like the... It kind of is and it isn't the core of the system. I'd be interested to hear if anyone has actually played this for a long amount of time as to how much you actually use the tokens. So, we're going to go to the monastery. And I think our first place is kind of literally a monastery to begin with. Um, and it's going to have elements of fields and roads. So, we're going to choose two aesthetic elements for our monastery. So I like the idea of it being a herb garden. In fact, we're going to go ahead and call it, this is like the town of Herb Garden. And yeah, so that there is a, there's a Herb Garden growing here. And um, underground catacombs I'm feeling drawn to. Maybe even both. Maybe there's like the people that live in this monastery. They sort of cultivate these herbs both above and below ground. Um, we're going to choose a piece of folklore about this place which we don't need to worry about now but I'm going to say that this place has some folklore about it and that folklore is the generous mentor and her betrayal so each type of place has this kind of list where it gives you kind of moves to help you kind of describe that place so Newt is here in Herb Garden, starting off his journey. So we can describe the rhythm of daily life. So maybe Newt's been here for a little while now. He's um, he's recovering from his previous kind of journey, and that is the journey where he he reached what he was hoping would be his destination, which was this um, the Great Sky Tower. So he was traveling, you know, through the mountains for several months. But, you know, no matter how high he reached, he, he never felt like he'd reached his destination. And then from there he headed over here, which is to the, you know, he, he'd heard of a monastery with a great teacher. But when he arrived, the, um, the person that he was meant to meet, um, essentially told him that this wasn't the destination that he was looking for essentially so sounds to me like we have a character that we need to put in here a non-player character and in this game they are called kith which is kind of a word that i hate saying out loud <laughs> now that i've had to say it um when you have kith you um let me find them here we go if you're playing with multiple players, you kind of have somebody else kind of take on that character, but we're doing it solo, so we're going to create that character ourselves. So when we create a kith, um, I believe we give them two natures, traits rather, which is kind of like, the, it's the personality equivalent of, you know, these natures. I can't find the kith page. I've, I've already probably gone past it multiple times. But all you need to know is that you're going to pick two of these traits um, and use them to kind of flesh out this this character. So we, we do. You'd also give them like you know name, pronouns, animal type. Um, so we're going to take our animal from here. We're going to go with a crocodile because that crocodile is just leaping out at me, and we're going to pick 
a couple of traits that this crocodile has. So this crocodile was the person that we came to meet at Herb Garden, who we were hoping would be this great teacher. And um, my spelling caiman correctly there in terms of like if there were a caiman rather than a crocodile. Again, a word that I don't think I've ever had to type down. So Cayman was the great teacher, but um, they turned out not to be. So we're going to say that they were honest. And maybe they were like, I think venerable is a good one. So then we can look for these traits here and it will give us a clue as to what this character might be doing. Thank you, Remain, for the spell check. Um, I'll, I'll take that spelling that I've got there. Um, so if they are honest. An honest kid always says what's on their mind. So they can point out the truth that everybody else has been ignoring. And they can ask, do you want my opinion? So when we arrived to meet Cayman, who we were told was going to be this great teacher, um... They laid out the facts as they could see it. So I guess the facts were that we were looking for a great teacher to give us kind of the answers, but perhaps the answers that we're looking for, um, they can't really just be taught by a teacher. They have to be experienced. And the coming journey is going to be our teacher rather than finding some wise person that already knows all the answers. We've got to get out there for ourselves. And uh, and the, the journey will be our teacher, I guess. And the trait is that they are ve venerable. So, you know, they are an old, an old caiman. Tell someone how they will re repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, that's more to do with when we've got a token. Show what things were like in more grim times. So perhaps this came and says, so while, while the war was happening, it wasn't safe for people to travel this land. So pilgrims used to just huddle in monasteries and, you know, think that they could find the answers in, in solitude and prayer and, and reading books and debating with each other. But the real truth is now that the land is safe and it's actually, you know, it's safe to travel again. So we need to realise that we're not in those grim times anymore. We can actually, we can actually get out there and get the answers for ourselves. And perhaps they are the ones that tell us now's the time to head to the old, the old place which is, let's say it's, an, it's a ruin on an island. So it's, it's a place that was, it was ruined but even before the war. And if we can get there, we'll get a sense of what life was like before all this conflict. And that might give us some of the answers that we're looking for. Okay, I'm gonna use this opportunity to gain a token. And we're going to pause for a moment and get some rest. I'm going to take a token. So we spend the night inside the monastery. And, you know, Cayman puts us up and spends the night sort of telling us these stories and kind of, I guess, letting us down easily. And we, uh, we get some rest with them. Now, as well as places and people, there is another element to the world that is represented in this game. And it's going to force me to remember how to rotate. Here we go. Which is the seasons. So this game has its own calendar, which is normally like a red flag in a game because 
when I see a sort of more traditional RPG that wants to have its own month and its own calendar, I always think it's kind of indulgent. But in this game, they actually matter and they actually do something because if you're traveling, then obviously it matters where you're traveling through, but it also matters when you are carrying out that journey. And the months are kind of divided into, the, there's 10 months across five seasons, and they're all very kind of archetypal of a particular time of year. And each of these, each of these seasons has its own kind of, has its own kind of moves as well. And its own kind of prompts. So this is why the game really got me excited. I think this was like the tipping point where I was like, okay, now I now I really like it. Because you've got all these natures which are like little, you know, just single page prompts. That might help you capture like the feel of a, the feel of a, a hollow place. Or the feel of a swamp. And... You also have the same for different times of year. So monsoon feels very much like the type of year, the time of year that we are in right now, in, in Manchester, UK at least, because we've had we've had till soil, I guess, which is like the chill has ended, and you know the ground has just warmed enough for planting. So this is kind of your spring planting season, and then monsoon is when everybody has kind of. You feel like spring has started and then all of a sudden you get hit with a load of rain, which is great for the plants, but not so good for your spirits. So let's say that we are we are in monsoon. The game kind of advises that you start in till soil, which is like the first, first month of the year, but we're going with monsoon because it's kind of evocative of where we're at right now. So we wake up the next morning. We've had our rest. I've earned my token. And we look outside and we can see all the sort of residents of Herb Garden that would normally be tending to the herbs are are not outside. They're all kind of sheltered. Perhaps they're kind of like looking pensively out of the window um, because there is absolute torrential rain. It's like an absolute downpour. We're choosing one thing that this place lacks. So... This place is lacking any kind of moments of clear skies. So there is beautiful green plant life. So the herbs are kind of thriving. But the sky is just filled with these brooding clouds. And it's just the, the down, downpour is absolutely torrential. Um, and then we're going to choose three or four things from these lists. To help kind of, you know, give the feel that this monastery is existing within this monsoon time. So, lots of tea. Oh, there we go. See, I was... I was right about the tea. So perhaps all these kind of gardeners that are like looking out into the herb garden that's getting pelted with rain. Maybe they're each kind of sipping a cup of tea. And you know, they've got heavy quilt blankets over them as well. And um, I, I like this bored kids. Bored kids jumping in giant puddles. So yeah, some of the children are stuck inside with the gardeners, but there's a few kind of rebellious children that are out splashing around in the puddles. And, um, you know, their parents are kind of calling them in. So this is where our raccoon and ferret are. So two kind of young, a young raccoon and a young ferret are out jumping in the puddles, kind of splashing water at each other. So... It's, it's a bit of a rough time to be um, going on a journey, but we, we might use this as an opportunity to gain a token. Um, let's inconvenience ourselves to help someone else. So, we head over to the gardeners, and we're going to offer to, you know, we've been given a bed at this place, so we're going to offer to do some of the gardening today in the rain. So we're going to spend the morning out in the um, out in the um, in the downpour, tending to these herbs, because you know I'm guessing these are kind of specialist herbs that are used for kind of medicinal purposes. 
So they need to make sure that they're kind of um, clipped at the right time. Make sure that they're being kept in their own kind of spots. And, you know, we can always shield ourselves from harsh conditions. So we pull up our hood and we just kind of tend to all of these herbs and, you know, we go down into the catacombs that are below, um, that are below the monastery. And we sort of tend to these underground herbs as well. And we're going to take this moment to bask in the grandeur of the world. So in these catacombs, these are like natural caves that exist underneath the monastery. And as the rain is kind of pouring down, you know, it, it sounds, from underground, it sounds almost like when you're inside a, a glass roof building in a storm and you can just hear the rain pounding down. And it's um, it's sort of dripping down through holes, coming down these stalactites, and it's kind of causing this like symphony of like droplet sounds and the occasional kind of torrent of water fl flushing down into the cavern. So I'm taking a token for that bit of. I mean, you, is is that a moment of grandeur, or is that a tiny moment of beauty? I think we've we, you know we've got the point. So, we're soaking wet, we've, um, we've done some work, um, but maybe it's time for us to actually think about getting out onto the road. So, I'm just looking down these spend a token things. So, after our morning of working, we're going to recite a small prayer, because we can always do that. So we're looking for kind of guidance and direction. And in doing so, I will remember that this place is also a field and a road. So I'm going to make this small prayer, and as I do so, we're going to look around the surroundings of the town. Perhaps it's more of a walking prayer, out walking in the rain. So in a field, we can always show someone, so show someone looking for something lost. So we're looking for some guidance and somebody in this field is looking for something lost. And the aesthetic elements we're going to have. A solitary tree is good, so maybe someone is sheltering under this tree that's in the field and they're you know they're a shepherd so the shepherd is um in this kind of world shepherd has bumblebees um instead of uh instead of sheep and let's say they're a turtle we're sticking with the whole kind of reptile element of this part of the world so they are a turtle shepherd, and it's said that they're friendly. So what does that mean? Now, oh well, I, I have some thoughts, but let's, let's do this bit first. So the shepherd is missing something. I suppose they're ob the obvious thing to, would be that they're missing one of their bumblebees. So we start up a conversation with them. You know, we're offering to help, uh, help them find the bumblebee. We sort of take them around the field. Um, th they're hesitant to sort of go out into the rain because their their bumblebees are all kind of huddled under this solitary tree to get some shelter from this downpour. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to go and see if we can... Well, no, maybe we're going to spend a token because our tokens are piling up here. So I think maybe we need to accept that in this weather, um, perhaps that the river's kind of burst its banks and perhaps it's, it's not just that they've lost one of their bumblebees. Perhaps they were kind of swept away by the water and there's, there's nothing we can really do about it. 
you know maybe it will have escaped and it'll uh, it'll find its way back home but we we can't really go looking for it so perhaps we need to help them kind of accept that perhaps this they've lost a member of their flock so we can ease somebody's pain if only for a moment by spending a token and what might that look like so we'll explain to um to this turtle sorry tortoise who is a shepherd will explain that we you know we are kind of we're heading out into the world on our own and without trying to make it sound tacky perhaps we are kind of lost and we're getting swept swept along by the river and it's it feels slightly out of our control but we also know that sometimes you have to kind of trust that you're going to end up where you need to be and perhaps perhaps this bee will be lost from their flock but you know bees bees can survive water and maybe they will find a new flock or maybe they will find a happier life on their own and we, we kind of we we leave the, the tortoise feeling a little bit better so now that we're slightly outside of the the kind of monastery i guess the last part of this location was road wasn't it So a road. This place can always keep someone from getting where they're get, trying to go to. Push someone forward and give them a token. So I think this is our moment where we we get onto the road. And we kind of look back to Herb Garden. Perhaps the rain is slightly easing to just a drizzle. In fact, I'm going to spend a token. So if I spend this token, I'm, this might be pushing my luck. I don't know if this is technically what we're meant to be doing with it. But I'm going to spend a token to keep somebody safe from the difficulties of the world. Now I'm stretching that to include the rain. And I'm going to say that there is a bit of respite from the rain. Just long enough for all of the children of Herb Garden to come out and be able to play the gardeners are able to come out and see to the see to the herb garden and sort of collect the herbs that they need to and there's just a little bit of respite there and we're kind of taking this as a signal to to head on down the road and we're we're following our putting our fate well that was one of our things isn't it where is it Place your fate in improbable coincidence and have it work out. So we are just going to walk down this road. We're not going to worry about our direction. We know that we're looking for this place, this old island or ruin, but we're just going to trust in the road. Push someone forward and give them a token. Can we be that someone? I think so. So I'll take the token. So the aesthetic elements of this road. A lively waterway yeah perhaps it's like actually kind of flooded at the moment um and the grooves in the ground perhaps it's kind of like the gut the, the water's kind of draining out to the gutter along the side of this road now um and yeah the folklore we're, we're not going to worry about that too much now so as you will see as you can see a whole lot of this game is spent well again th this is purely based on my experience of just now but my feel of this game is that the mechanics are so simple that it's just this token thing but so much of this game is just looking at lists and choosing things which it's like an interesting take on this idea of like procedural generation that i normally really enjoy when it comes from dice but the fact that you're choosing it is a lot more enjoyable than I was expecting. And again, this kind of low conflict thing is really kind of cool for like, like I feel like this, you know, Newt the Pilgrim, I feel like he's got some interesting stuff going on with his character. And I feel like I'd be interested to see how his journey ends up. So, you know, perhaps we'll do another, perhaps we will do a part two where we actually push this forward. Um, for being like a simple game, it does ask quite a lot of you, especially when you're playing solo because you're having to constantly like come up with stuff. And you know, it is almost like kind of world building. Um, 
that you're, you're just doing solo. Um, I think I kind of covered the one bit that I didn't really cover of the the way the game works is at the end of each, you know, you kind of choose when the month ends as to when it makes sense. And each season is two months. And at the end of each season, there is a festival, which gives you some, you know, more dramatic prompts and it kind of connects into your kind of character advancement, I guess, where um, at the end of a festival, you, you pick something from a list that's going to be like an, an advance, I guess, for your character. So that is Wonder Home. And I think it's really cool and really interesting. And for me, even if... I, I'm, I'm going to try this again. We'll do, we'll do another stream on this. I'm going to continue this character. But even if I, after playing it a little bit further, even if it doesn't click for me and I feel like I'm not going to do this again, I think this book... I'm going to make a bold claim. This book, more so than I think any other book that I have, kind of feels like a world encapsulated in a book. It feels like a world that you can explore because, you know, it's 270-odd pages and the vast majority of them are just like prompts and just sparks, you know, like, I, like I've talked about spark tables before and how much I love those and like the touchstones in Electric Bastion, and there's so many of those things in Electric Bastion Land that I find useful. And this game is like, this book is like an entire book of them. So if I was running a game in Deep Country about exploration, you know, using Electric Bastion Land, having this book on hand would be pretty cool because when you get to a lagoon, you can kind of use it as kind of a little, little book of prompts. So I would encourage everyone to check it out. Um, you can get it on PDF and I think soft cover, I think, uh, copies are available. But we will definitely come back to this and we will continue the journey of Newt the Pilgrim. Um, as always, I want to say thank you to my Patreon supporters who make these streams possible. It's um, If you go to patreon.com forward slash bastion and you can see what's happening there. Um, you can find out more about everything else that I'm doing at bastionland.com. Um, next week, there will be a stream. It may not be on the Tuesday because next week is my birthday, so I might be taking a day off. Um, but we will um, we will do a stream at some point next week, but just be aware it might be on a slightly different day. Um, thank you for joining me on this pilgrimage. And um, until next time, it's goodbye for now.